This episode is brought to you by Brilliant. In the future we will need to create Earth-like environments on hostile, barren worlds so we can grow food, plants, and animals at those outposts, but what if we could also grow those outposts themselves? So today we'll be looking at the notion of self-growing habitats, bases able to grow from relatively small seeds into large habitats with little to no human assistance. And we will be examining this notion in the context of some current designs for Moon or Mars bases, all the way up to the notion of a tiny probe, not much bigger than a normal plant seed, that might be able to impact on an asteroid or moon and turn into a giant colony waiting for humans to move in, or perhaps even growing the humans there too. But we should begin with the basic concept of why it is so appealing for space. In simplest terms it's about two things. First, not needing to carry much equipment and building material to a site for a base, sourcing those in situ, and second, to minimize human effort once there, especially if the base needs some time and effort to provide basic life support. Now neither of those are new ideas. Indeed as a semi-nomadic hunter-gatherer species, the problem of having to carry your home with you has been pestering humanity for as long as we've been around, and has quite a few interesting answers in nature, as we see with animals like the crab that carries its home around with it. This is also a key notion in the seeds of most plants, but especially lightweight ones meant to be carried far away by the wind. So we can learn some answers from nature and also from modern business. I mentioned how a habitat or base might need to be able to be ready for humans the moment they arrive, or as quick as it can be. Right now, being an astronaut is a heroic and pioneering thing, but I suspect as time passes and we begin building or growing bases, outposts, and colonies on 10,000 minor plants in our solar system and a thousand on each of the major plants, that a lot of that allure will go away. It will seem less like a bored exploration and more like moving to a sparsely inhabited swamp with no electricity or running water, except for the swamp water running through the cracks in your shack. With that in mind, getting people to voyage out there might require offering a lot more than basic necessities on arrival, and we can take a page from the books of various hotels, motels, resorts, and Airbnbs. The general notion there is that it should be easy to find, easy to check in, and as soon as you walk in the door you've got all the basic comforts right there, especially some comfy bed, chair, or couch to rest your weary self in. So we want to be contemplating more than just having air and water available when our astronauts or settlers arrive. A warm bed and a hot meal waiting when you walk in is probably ideal. Sometimes it might need to be ready before they arrive too, especially in the cases of things like stalazers, big pushing beam platforms you build around stars to push whole fleets of spaceships up to interstellar velocities, and which we assume they will build at their destination too, allowing cheaper and faster travel between any two systems which have one. It's a lot nicer if some small vanguard ship or probe can arrive before the main colonial fleet does, to build such a stalazer and save them the slowdown fuel or let them travel there faster, like building an airport at a destination so you can fly in rather than trudge through tangled forests on foot the first time. In short terms though, when contemplating a trip to the moon or Mars and having a base there, our two big objectives are minimizing the mass they need to carry there and minimizing the setup time of the living space and its life support gear. Inflatable habitats are very interesting to us in this regard, as are options like robot construction crews who could bulldoze the local rock and regolith in to form shelters or reinforce them. Air, water, and shelter are the immediate needs, and shelter is the heaviest one of those. To be sure a thin inflatable wall might do the job, indeed we can imagine an ultra strong bubble made of just a few layers of graphene that can keep the air in and the vacuum out or the hostile non-breathable air of some world like Titan, or the swamp ward of Dagobah, breathable but smelly. The thing is, you have to worry about micrometeors and radiation in lots of environments, and your best protections against both is a nice thick layer of mass, to substitute in for all that missing atmosphere. Handily a lot of airless walls will non-coincidentally be low in gravity, which makes building easier. Your typical cinder block weighs about 35 pounds on Earth, but only about 6 pounds on the Moon. Incidentally it would be 16 kilograms in both places. A kilogram is a measure of mass, not weight, 
and thus is the same anywhere in the universe, whereas weight is the product of mass and local gravitational force. It is mass that protects us from radiation though, so it's handy that on the Moon, an inflatable structure no thicker or tougher than a modern tile inner tube could easily have several tons of material stacked on top of it. We have a lot of options for those materials, and of course the basic version is usually whatever regolith is lying around, but water is a pretty good option too, especially as you need that to live. Packing that loose regolith into some compact and sturdy block you can build with is trickier. We have a lot of proposed methods, and one I recently got to hear explained by Christopher Marrow of Red House Studio is being experimented with at NASA Ames with Dr. Lynn Rothschild and also down in Namibia, to create homes and food and it's all about mushrooms. There we see a plant that has rather run amok, damaging ecosystems and farming and sucking up water that isn't good for animal grazing either, but it is excellent as a substrate for growing mushrooms in. They can then eat or sell those mushrooms and use the remainder of the substrate to compress into a building brick for homes. Very innovative and very easy to see in play on early outposts where you need to be using and reusing everything in every way you can, like having your plants do quintuple duty producing food, recycling air, recycling water, and serving as your fibers and building materials. The project in Namibia and these biobricks or mycoblocks are a fascinating approach, and one of many examples of new materials being made from mushrooms in this case a building block as strong as concrete and dimensional lumber, and more than we can discuss here today so I will link the Namibia Biohab project in the episode description for you to check out. But the basic idea of adapting this to off-world bases is that you are going to inflate your habitat as a twin-walled and mini-chambered tent, then you are going to fill those chambers with water and grow algae in them. That algae will later be dried out and used as substrate for growing mushrooms and other mycelium for food and the waste matter compressed into stony building blocks, which can later be composted for soil if you want. In the meantime, the water and algae are absorbing radiation and recycling carbon dioxide. There is a melanin-rich fungi that can absorb and transduce radiation into biomass radiosynthesis. that accumulated melanin can promote radiation attenuation through Compton scattering. There is also radiation absorbing lipids formed by the mycelium metabolization. We have types of fungi and also algae that produce fats and lipids which are better at absorbing some radiation than water, and we have types that are melanin rich and good for ionizing radiation. You've probably heard about the fungus growing around the ruins of Chernobyl. Both algae and fungus have a wide and growing versatility of applications and are not terribly picky about where they grow. One of current special interest is Fat Choy, colony forming diazotrophs potentially able to fix nitrogen from Martian air, though the algae is principally for making biomass. This technique might work on some worlds better than others. For instance, while Mars doesn't have a lot of atmospheric nitrogen, it still has way more than the Moon, whereas Venus and Titan have more than Earth, and we could potentially be trying something like literal hanging gardens on Venus by having buoyant floating growth chambers high in the Venusian atmosphere rather than domes deep down on the molten surface. Indeed, we might with even better biotech have growing balloons that self-inflated from their gas exhalations and byproducts. Interesting side note, mushrooms hold the status of being the protein source with the lowest water needs, which makes it potentially an ideal crop for a lot of settings out in space. One can easily imagine a sunlight and ice poor asteroid being very reliant on microculture for protein, clothing, mushrooms make a great leather alternative, and as a fiber feedstock for building materials and 3D printers, and the same for fungi in general and algae as well. New space habitats will generally be both small for ecosystems and simplistic in biodiversity initially, and so fungi, algae, and microbes in general are ideal for those locations. We may be able to come up with tailored blends of those organisms that could take a mix of water and the local regolith and break it down to soil and nutrients for more picky terrestrial plants, or break down regolith and release oxygen gas as a byproduct for breathing and inflation. And as we all seen, while trying to set up a livable habitat and biology on another world is no easy matter, 
Transplanting the biology of Earth using that same biology of Earth offers a lot of possible solutions. This is not to downplay the mechanical and electronic roles, or those for robots and artificial intelligence, but we have a tendency to picture biotech growing organic structures or of robots building inorganic ones. My own belief is that we will see a constant hybridization going on, and that this will all be grown architecture but that this will come in a lot of forms. Early on, expect a lot of robots to be dumped out of spaceships onto the moon and remote controlled directly from Earth by people, since the signal lag is just a few seconds, and some of those vehicles could be carrying a lot of inflatable structures and power generators. Expect the robots to be all about manipulator arms and scoops. With that in mind, do not think of inflatable as weak. Indeed you can make it quite rigid and sturdy by drop stitching and segmenting as we see with lots of modern inflatables for camping. That's a great reminder too how technology developed for space can be used down here and vice versa, camping gear alone is a multi-billion dollar industry. Drop stitch incidentally is basically having a lot of connecting strings between the walls and membrane that could potentially be quite a mesh, especially as things start growing on it and even more especially if you are adding in your own light rather than raw sunlight. Your algae filler can grow a lot faster and better if the LEDs or fiber optics bringing in the light are also your drop stitching, making your light source permeated through a given chamber, not just the edges. It's an interesting option for the moon where your cycle is algae or something else photosynthetic that you grow using sunlight, then use the remains of for growing fungi on in the dark since the moon has a day that lasts a month, two weeks of light, two weeks of dark. That can be very rough on a lot of larger plants, but the fast growing and simplistic microorganisms seem to handle that better. So you might do that in a month long production cycle, like growing cyanobacteria for two weeks, harvesting it, then letting the leftovers be a microcultural substrate for two weeks, getting those mushrooms and then baking and compressing it when the sun returns in solar kilns and presses. Speaking of meshes inside inflatable chambers though, I should also note that when it comes to lightweight filler that aerogel is likely to be your king. We can spin that out of carbon or silicon so long as we have both the power to do so and a supply of either of those two materials, and silicon is very abundant on the moon's surface. And carbon and silicon are plentiful on many asteroids too, and it is decently likely that we could get aerogel manufacture running on the moon. Aluminum is also common there and honestly there's not many places you'd have problems finding silicon, carbon, or aluminum, or oxygen or iron. There's a lot you can build out of those five elements and that includes rocket fuel. When it comes to robots on the moon, and one reason I favor a moon base before Mars, you can control everything from Earth, letting you prototype all your equipment there, and I would say our robotics is already up to the task. Automated robots run by even simple AI far from Earth, like Mars or on an asteroid, is another story, but I would rather get the mechanics down first than worry about the AI controlling it where we cannot. Though in many cases you would have processes that humans could control, either accepting the light lag for communications or being done by astronauts in orbit or on their ship before debarking. Truth be told, given that the spaceship needs to be designed to keep people alive for extended periods anyway, the only thing the landing site absolutely needs built before arrival is the actual landing pad. Obviously you can skip that too, as we did with the Apollo missions, but those same missions taught us why a dust-free solid pad was not a luxury. A ship landing and unloading its delicate cargo of people and gear on a dust-free, hardened pad is going to make your life much easier. You do not want nasty lunar regolith getting into your gear. This is not just an inconvenience either, we are honestly lucky we didn't lose any of our Apollo astronauts to regolith damage to them or their gear or other complications. Self-growing or self-repairing concrete is a material that would be amazingly useful here on Earth and obviously great for space colonies, but in any case, landing a robot with a bulldozer and a hydraulic press to scoop and tamp till you got something decently rigid and dust free would probably do. 
midterm, I think we would see solo kilns for making our building material, beginning with something that can take regolith, separate out the aluminum, and then melt and roll that into shiny sheets we could use as mirrors for more solo kilns. Your first ones would probably be inflatable reflective mesh panels brought along from home. The image we paint then is one of bots for obtaining ice and scoop bots scooping materials for construction, or manipulation into other forms, and those bots would likely bring along the electronics and rail materials that they might need. It's building huge tanks of algae and huge rays of mirrors for aiming at solar kilns, or solar panels, or other solar thermal applications. A lot of the furniture for people is likely to be inflatable too, since we already have some nice inflatable furniture, and humans weigh less there, making those a better option. This is probably what our early moon base looks like on Day 2, where Day 1 was the arrival of the astronauts. They probably bring in all their personal gear and furnishings with them. We usually imagine months or even years earlier we are dropping robots, and not just once but following up with additional inflatable structures and construction supplies, and with extra air, water, and food as redundant backups for the astronauts. That gives more survival modes for a screw-up, since as an example, it's not hard to imagine your landing pod getting damaged on the actual landing and wrecking a lot of your supplies, and getting the people out and the gear out before that happens is needed for survival, but not if you only need the people because they have those supplies as backups. Pre-positioning spares is in many ways as important as pre-building the base. But we would not expect these to be all that self-growing, just self-inflating, and maybe good at stockpiling rock, air, water, and maybe reflective materials, building materials and raw biomass for plastics or bioreactors or soil. Which is a lot, but we're not talking about some pea-sized seed landing on the moon and becoming a whole community, and with that in mind as we move into the deeper future, it stands repeating both what self-replicating machine really means and also how a single type of replicating robot, a tiny little nanobot, isn't the be-all and end-all of self-replication. We do not currently utilize simple self-replicators on Earth, not just because they're technologically tricky, but because there's no real benefit yet to developing the technology solely for Earth use. There is very little that a self-replicating machine can do on Earth that humans couldn't already do cheaper using simpler methods or off-the-shelf components. A big factory or a Walmart is already a self-replicating machine, it just includes humans as part of that process. The Walmart isn't undergoing mitosis to spawn a new pair in the parking lot, it's rely on us to plant it, but so is a seed inside a tasty berry that some bird ate and later left fertilized far away. We don't actually need self-replicating buildings and structures here on Earth, they offer no tangible advantage compared to self-repairing or self-assembling structures, or those which do so in some fashion that requires little attention or effort or cost on our part. Drones that repair your road for you are just as appealing as some organic road that heals itself. So too as we've discussed elsewhere, while you could probably send a hard drive the size of a pea across interstellar distances, full of terabytes of data and diagrams, and just a few hundred tiny nanobots able to copy themselves and build things, and from that, colonize an entire planet, there's no advantage to doing so. You could as easily plant that pea on an asteroid here at home and tell it to turn that into a thousand giant colony ships instead. Small seeds are useful and are a focus for the remainder of the episode, along with what we can do with them, but we should not assume that this automatically means we will hurl a trillion of them out across the galaxy as opposed to armadas of classic self-replicators, which is to say, fleets full of people with resources, energy, a goal, and willpower. One modest asteroid of the size of which we have thousands here in our solar system contains the raw materials to build millions of ships that would each dwarf an aircraft carrier, and if only one in ten of them successfully arrived in another solar system, and repeated that blossoming and sent out more of themselves, the galaxy would be filled up pretty quick and easy, with no appreciable time difference over sending a colony seed out to each system directly from Earth. With that caveat aside, just because we can build bigger does not mean that we should. 
If a tiny self-replicating pod gets the job done, it is presumably no harder to build a hundred more of them than one a hundred times bigger. Now there are reasons why you can't throw something tiny up to ultra-relativistic speeds and expect it to survive the trip with its data intact. And it's the same reason we want to be able to get mass in situ for moon bases, radiation blocking is principally about mass and density and thickness, space is full of dangerous photons and particle radiation, and at fast enough speeds, even regular photons you and I can see are so blue shifted they are damaging things. So you need a nice thick walled ship, and it kinda stands to reason your ship should have as much cargo as it does hull plating, and things containing dense data like frozen embryos or ultra miniaturized computer memory tend to be the things most vulnerable to radiation damage. But that might just mean your minimum interstellar seed was a 10 ton lead sphere rolling through space with a 1 ton core full of frozen fertilized eggs, digital memory, and microscopic self replicating bots. You don't need that much computer memory for DNA either. DNA data is vastly compressible as there's tons of overlap between species, and inside a species the differences are virtually nil, you could probably get them all on a single modern hard drive. Plus, while there are many millions of species, not just the several thousands of big animals, bacteria have short DNA strands and any non-microscopic species so rare we don't even know of it yet probably is not irreplaceably critical to life on some new world under an alien sun or inside a giant cylinder habitat. If it is later found, a digital copy of its DNA can be sent to that colony at light speed anyway, and printed. So more likely, any large hard drive on a pod would not only include their DNA or historical highlights or great novels, but also be copies of their minds. You might not be waiting for colonists just growing them bodies or building them android shells and downloading their minds into them on their arrival. So what do we really mean by self-growing habitats and what would one really be like? Well it is possible to send DNA, frozen or digital, and grow it on site. Indeed it need not even be sent with the pod, you could beam the data there after it arrived. So a self-growing base could absolutely include a seed that had seeds for all sorts of other life forms. This is actually a really good lifeboat or nature preserve option. You can design hypothetical ecosystems back home, load up the right DNA and parameters, and ship it off to find or build a suitable world. This definitely requires sophisticated AI however, it's not just plain Noah to a lot of existing animals on a ship, it has got to grow and birth each species equivalent of Adam and Eve and raise them, though I should be careful using the term it as it might simply be an uploaded human mind. I can easily imagine us being reluctant to rely on an artificial intelligence to make new worlds or grow new humans. It really would not be hard to imagine getting asked to let them copy my mind to send out to countless worlds to go build the place and raise its first generations. I'd probably say yes and I suspect many of our viewers would too. And since you can make copies, you don't need that many volunteers. Of course if you can do that, there's no real reason you can send the minds of those first generations or a whole uploaded civilization rather than one lone advisor and a parent. Indeed you could copy the same digital colony for use on many worlds, or use variations drawn from a slightly larger pool to have many varying colonies, built from the millions of perturbations of colonist copies. This is part of why I would expect bigger ships as seeds, you can only send the really small ones if you've got great self-replicators, in which case your only real limit on ship size is available spare mass because building and equipping a spaceship is no longer like carefully hand tailoring a pocket watch, it's like growing a field of wheat instead. Some folks who have grown wheat or corn or some other staple crop might now be saying, yeah Isaac but that's not super easy either, you've got the weeds and pests issue, and I'd say, great point, thanks for that awesome segue, because while on the surface we wouldn't expect self-growing habitats to have to deal with pests or weeds, as we initially tend to assume sealed, sanitized environments, it would seem that an environment of self-growing architectural or space habitats would almost inevitably get its mutants, weeds, viruses, and so on eventually, and at the scale of trillions of habitats, all with different control measures and exchange rules. For context, imagine a self-growing O'Neill cylinder, one of many sprouting out the side of some asteroid growing until it's ready to be cut free, like fruits off any tree. 
one of millions produced this way or by other methods. That's not an environment a known virus or cold can spread through, the void of space, empty of everything but radiation and hypersonic debris. But if our habitat can be said to grow there, then that means other things can too. Just probably not very natural things, but same as we have symbiotes, parasites, predators, and invaders in our own ecosystem, I can't really imagine a solar system packed full of self-growing habitats wouldn't get them too, even if they were only created by a handful of malicious people. It's more likely you'd have all sorts of overlapping programs and species of self-replicator and habitat grower or species forger that just accidentally got dropped somewhere or transplanted. I could imagine that as a handful of tiny nanobots that came over in a bottle of wine from some other habitat's vineyard, and now kept trying to repurpose any dead tree into vine-supporting trellises, and maybe folks even wake up one morning to see the kilometer telephone poles and cables has been turned into trellises, complete with a wire bound up like it was a grapevine. An amusing case compared to, say, your cylinder habitat getting a cancerous growth where some foreign replicator was trying to grow antennae and radiators. And yet that amusing case is sort of the thing I'd expect, as it would just be a low priority for trying to get rid of, and folks might find it an amusing prank to dump it somewhere. Civilizations with good self-replicators and AI just smart enough to do their jobs can get some weird things going on, too like they are all banned from growing or copying humans themselves, but are built to want colonists and are allowed to advertise for them, so one goes and parks itself near an inhabited world and grows a giant banner or figurehead of whatever it sees as the most popular topic or meme on the internet, which to keep the show family friendly we will assume will be a picture of a cat asking for a cheeseburger, or it playing commercials saying it is such a family friendly habitat It populated its entire ecosystem out of various creatures that look like kittens, puppies, and ponies. And there's not a single sharp corner anywhere in it for kids to hurt themselves on. Weird examples, but probably a case where reality would be even stranger than fiction, or those examples. To make a self-growing habitat that has to manage and create a viable ecosystem all the way down to the bedrock and superstructure means giving a lot of creative control and brains to manage all the perturbations that will occur in the system as it grows and establishes itself. This could result in a lot of strange options, especially if it was allowed access to some open source colonial equipment and organism database, a standard template construct which is something I'd almost take for granted would develop inside the next millennia or so. It is also very likely any such self-growing habitat, be it a big home base, or an individual home for a family, a cylinder habitat, or a terraform planet, would have some sort of prime directive and various secondaries of various priority, whether that's take care of people, or attract new colonists, or hoard resources, or whichever, that leaves a lot of room for perverse instantiation and paperclip maximizer types of scenarios. I should note that having actual humans on site guiding these decisions or implementing them is no sort of barrier to weird developments either, quite to the contrary I would think. It seems almost inevitable that we will be wanting to develop these sorts of self-growing habitats to get out there in space and they are likely to vary a lot in purpose, independence, and variety, and ever more so the further forward in time and deeper out in space we go. One thing seems sure though, as our habitats grow, whether under our direct oversight or not, mostly built or mostly grown, much like our own ecosystems here on Earth, they will only grow in variety and diversity, just like the ecosystems and civilizations contained inside them. One of the things we try to do on this show is encourage people to rekindle their love affair with science and curiosity about the universe around us, past, present, and future. Watching videos like today's is a great way to get an overview and learn the basics of different topics, but to gain an understanding of why and how concepts work the way they do, you have to try it yourself, and for that, I recommend heading over to Brilliant, today's sponsor. Brilliant is an interactive STEM learning platform that helps you truly understand concepts in math, science, and computer science by guiding you through engaging hands-on courses, and if you feel stuck, Brilliant provides in-depth explanations to break down the material for you even more. 
haven't touched these topics in years and need a refresher on the basics, don't be intimidated. Even pros often need refreshers. Just try Brilliant's new Everyday Math course, which takes you through the foundational subjects with their trademark interactivity. For instance, a lot of people have struggled with fractions, but when you approach them in a visual way, they make a lot more sense. With Brilliant, you will be presented bite-sized pieces that you can learn at your own pace when and where you want. To get started for free, visit Brilliant.org slash Isaac Arthur or click on the link in the description, and the first 200 people will get 20% off Brilliant's annual premium subscription. So we're done for today but we have our Sci-Fi Sunday episode, Multi-Species Empires, coming up this weekend. Follow next week by asking what would happen if Earth lost the Sun and became a rogue planet. After that we'll ask how people travel around planets once they settle there, be it hang gliding through the clouds of Venus or darting between shadowy craters on sun roasted Mercury. Then we'll take a look at the concept of a technological singularity, an artificial intelligence of stunning capability appearing seemingly overnight, and ask if that outcome is inevitable. Now, if you want to lose when those and other episodes come out, make sure to subscribe to the channel and hit the notifications bell, and if you enjoyed this episode, please hit the like button, share it with others, and leave a comment below. You can also join in the conversation on any of our social media forums, find our audio-only versions of the show, or donate to support future episodes, and all those options and more are listed in the links in the episode description. Until next time, thanks for watching, and have a great week.